Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversation. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. Welcome to another episode of Mosaic Minds Podcast. My name is Nick, and to my right here is Jason. And today we are joined by Pete Robbins. He's a trusted and widely published writer in the bass fishing world and has covered tournament scenes for nearly two decades. He is a senior writer for Bassmaster and a longtime blogger for Gary Yamamoto's Inside Line. And Pete's expertise extends beyond bass fishing into adventure travel and blue water angling. And his work has appeared in publications like Texas Monthly. His latest venture, Half Past First Cast, is a fishing travel service he co-founded with his wife and is hosting trips to destinations like Mexico and Alaska. So welcome to the show, Pete. Uh, could you give us just a, expand on that a little bit and just give us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you're at today? Sure. I, like a lot of people, love to fish. But unlike a lot of people, I grew up in a non-fishing family. Um, it's something, I don't know whether the milkman was into it or the plumber was into it, but it's something that I've always known since I was six years old that I wanted to do it and followed a pretty traditional career path, had a day job, still have a day job on top of my writing and fell through a series of sort of happy accidents into the world of outdoor writing and got into it in my mid thirties. I'm 54 now. And it changed my life to find something that you're passionate about and that you can contribute to and make a little money at it and get a chance to travel the world doing it. It's I, I advise it to anyone, whether your passion is collecting coins or raising Siamese cats, find a way to make a life out of it and and really pursue it to the fullest. Um, I, I won't get too deep into this, but my father is passionate about Asian art. He collects art from India, Nepal, Tibet, China, places like that. He has no interest whatsoever in fishing, but I can say that my fishing career is sort of modeled on his career. He found what he liked, didn't care whether other people liked it, and, and sort of took it to the fullest and, and made a lifestyle out of it. And that's cool. really what I would encourage people to do. Yeah. It's never day work if you enjoy the topic. Um, Did you, were, were you a, were you always into writing? Like, is that something that you've always been passionate about? Did you like writing or did that kind of come as a byproduct of, of uh, the fishing world? I think I liked it. I, I went to law school, so it was kind of a requirement that you had to be able to write convincingly. Yeah. Um, I, I fell into it when I was about 30, 31. A friend of mine had a website uh, for the Virginia Bass Federation, and he needed help with it. And I just realized that I can crank out a lot of work on uh, on fishing. I mean, I, I like to joke that I write faster than anyone who writes better than me, and I write better than anyone who writes faster than me. Um, I write thousands of words a week. I don't think I mean, I mean, like you were saying, Jason, there's never a day of work if you enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. Um, if I go a day without writing, which is extremely rare in the course of a year, I feel kind of like I didn't flex my muscles that day. There's a certain muscle memory. And by producing, I'm not saying everything that I produce is great, but by producing a lot of things, pretty often I can end up with something that I'm proud of. So the great Mark Twain would actually go fishing and he, he would dip his toes in the water and he didn't even have a hook on the end of the line, right? Because that was his solace. That was his uh, expression to leave me alone, basically. So he did some of his best thinking and writing to transition into eight hours of let's not go tournament fishing, let's go fun fishing versus a six to eight hour day of writing. What do you enjoy not more, but what, where do you see that those kind of intersect um, maybe at the intersection? I'll tell you where it really intersected for me in a positive way is that when I was in my 20s, when I got out of law school, I had never really fished out of a bass boat. I got totally into that tournament scene. And at 25, I was young and dumb. I thought I was going to be the next Kevin Van Dam. And I was fishing tournaments all the time. Every spare moment was spent practicing for a tournament or fishing a tournament. And somewhere along the way, I realized that I wasn't going to be the next Kevin Van Dam or the next Rick Klun. Um, but I didn't care because I love the competition. But then I got, as my writing started to take off, 
tournament fishing became a chore in some respects. I had to go to bodies of water that I didn't want to be on when fishing wasn't going to be good, stand there in the rain all day. And if there's something you're, you're passionate about and it stops being fun, you have to take a step back and say, why isn't this fun anymore? How can I rediscover what it was that I was passionate about in the first place? And through writing and particularly through travel in recent years, I rediscovered that. I rediscovered what it's like to go to Alaska, knowing nothing about trout fishing and not caring that I'm not an expert or that I'm not competing with someone, but just enjoying the moment and being present. And I, I know that's kind of a cliche, but I've really rediscovered my bliss in that sense. I still care about tournament fishing. I will always love bass fishing, but going to Panama and chasing tuna that I've never caught before is like, holy cow, I'm rediscovering what it was like to be 25 and fishing that first tournament again. So that's how you kind of branched off into the uh, into the adventure travel and the blue water angling was trying to trying to find trying to make it exciting again. Yeah, and, and it really just kind of happened organically, like the writing did. My, my wife and I were going to Mexico a lot, bass fishing. She took me for my 40th birthday. That was our first sort of adventure travel trip, and we ended up going back. And now it's been twenty something times to bass fish in Mexico. And I just started blogging about it in my blog for Yamamoto's Inside Line. And the owner of the lodge took notice. And he said, you know, I want you doing some writing for me. And that dovetail into her. He, he wanted her to organize a trip for women at one point. This was about 2016. And so she became a booking agent for the lodge. And then it just kind of, I married a girl from the suburbs of Chicago who had never fished until she met me when she was 33, 34. And I mean, now she's been to Brazil. She's been to Africa fishing. She loves it. She goes without me sometimes. Wow. And, and that's the that's the biggest gift someone could hope for. And it just kind of dovetail with all, all these sort of random introductions to people. We got randomly introduced to a guy in Panama who has an amazing lodge on an island in the Gulf of Cherokee there. And now we do some work for him. And it's just it, all that sort of organic growth. It, it's funny because in my day job, I'm a terrible networker. I hate going out and kind of making the small talk and, you know, trying to sell something. But when I'm talking about these fishing lodges, it doesn't feel like I'm selling something. And I think that's sort of a variation of your same point there. It, it feels like this is what I was meant to be doing all along. And the fact that I came to it in later, later in life, I could see as a problem. But I kind of feel like it's a blessing because I really appreciate the fact that I've lived through a job that I liked and I'm proud of, but that I was never passionate about. And to find your passion later in life is in some respects a very good thing because it makes you appreciate it more. Yeah. What's a day in the life? Like for me, I try to explain to Nick, when you're in a tournament with 150 boats and they're show anglers and they're standing for the national anthem. And I hate to describe it like this, man, but it's a bunch of rednecks trying to get to that fishing hole or that honey hole as fast as they can. And honestly, 75 mile an hour, 80 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour passing people, that's just part of the part of the grind. If, if Nick and I both have, both have high school age children that could be exposed to fishing for the first time, what's the allure in fishing that you can give Nick and maybe a family member or a friend to take them fishing for the first time on the local body of water? I, I think part of it is for certainly a parent and child or a parent and a young kid, it's the chance to be together. You can't get more than 20 feet apart all day while you're in the boat and you get to share those moments and share a common pastime a common interest but it's also that it's something that can't be perfected and you know i have a friend clark ream who's fished the bassmaster elite series and fished the flw tour for a long time and he always says that he realized early in life that he was never going to be good at sort of ball sports football baseball basketball i mean i don't have that genetic i'm five i'm a five foot ten guy with a middle-aged paunch and i i couldn't run fast i can't sing i can't dance i can't do any of those things um, I do think there's some natural ability involved in fishing, but it's a chance for people to get out of it what they want to get out of it. And a kid can go in, kid who's never going to run a, a 4 4 40 or never going to be able to dunk a basketball can go and can develop an expertise in this on his own and take it as far as he wants. Very well stated. I think it's the, it's the, you know, I'm a top order fanatic, you know. I don't throw it as much as I used to, which means obviously for a non-fishing crowd that the lure stays on top of the water and doesn't dive below the surface. But the point I'm making is if, if there's a little chop on the water, there's a little shade and a little cloud, 
I'm pretty happy, right, when I show up at the lake because I know that, hey, I might be able to throw this consistently throughout the day for sure some bites. However, if it's bluebird skies and it's blown out of the wrong way and it's 15 mile an hour wind, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I don't think the fish can see that lure. Talk to me about maybe a technique or two that you've developed or that everybody else knows about that you enjoy catching the fish. And then let's let's go one layer. Let's let's talk about the species as well, because based on your picture and, and your adventures across, you know, you're you're fishing for a little bit different than the traditional smallmouth, largemouth all the time. Sure. I mean, I, I'm the guy who likes to catch them however they're biting. But at the same time, you mentioned topwater, and I, I kind of realized recently that the common thread through the things that I like the best are, is the visual aspect of fishing. I mean, I like a largemouth topwater. We've gone to Brazil where you're throwing big wood choppers, which is a, a big bait with a propeller on the end. And in Brazil, the peacock bass like it as fast as you can retrieve it. So it's 100 degrees out, 90% humidity, and you're sweating. And these giant fish are chasing these baits in the middle of the day, and it's a very visual strike. Um, the tuna that we fish for in Panama, you see acres of them blowing up and you run the boat as fast as you can. You fire in a cast and sometimes one explodes on it immediately. Sometimes they go down and all of a sudden they're two miles away and the captain says, hold on. And you're going and then you get two miles away and there's acres of them blowing up again. Like to me, it's that I, I will always love a subsurface bite. I love catching fish deep, but there's something about seeing them on the surface and seeing them take the bait that is particularly thrilling. Um, when we go to Guatemala, we fish for sailfish and you troll teasers and it's really like a ballet. You're trolling these teasers and all of a sudden the captain yells, there's a fish on the long left teaser. And so suddenly you're te you're, it's a hookless bait. So suddenly you're dropping a bait with a hook back to this fish and you're watching his bill come up like a windshield wiper. And all of a sudden he grabs it and turns away and you have to react to that. And, that's what I really like, I think. That, that's the common thread for me. What was it that inspired you and your wife to uh, start start the half past first cast? And like, I mean, or what, what began that? Uh, part of it was after writing for all these other magazines for years. I mean, I, I'm afraid with the growth of AI and the shrinking of the magazine industry that there were gonna be fewer and fewer opportunities for someone who writes. That hasn't been the case. I feel like I have more writing to do than ever. But I wanted to have a property that was all our own, where we could just write about what we wanted to write about. If I saw a t-shirt I liked that I thought was funny, I can write an article on that. If I want to tell you how to get through the Mazatlan airport most efficiently, there's no real market for that. But I can create a site that, that specifically fulfills my needs and things that I care about and, and getting her involved. And, and she, I mean, she struggles with my wife has a learning disability, so she struggles with the writing part of it. So to watch her grow over the four years that we've been doing it and to see her writing get better and to see her speak specifically to a female audience ha has been extremely rewarding. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's cool. That, it, it's been a great experience. I mean, I've always said you don't want to work with family and, and working with your wife is probably particularly full of <laughs> minefields. But I mean, I'm the luckiest person on earth. I had parents who didn't fish, who encouraged me to fish. I had a wife who had never fished before, who embraced it fully. I always tell the story. We went to New Hampshire on vacation before we were engaged. Actually, it was definitely before we were engaged. And we were catching smallmouth bass that were bedding. You could catch 100 a day pretty easily. Wow. And we were supposed to meet people for dinner out. And I said, you know, we really need to go back and shower and clean up and get ready for dinner. And she said, we just need to catch one more. And I was like, this is definitely the woman I'm going to marry come hell or high water. Um, it's it's a great story that we've been together all over the world. And one more thing is she's sort of the softer side of me. I'm an introvert. I can spend hours by myself all day and it's not a problem. Um, we have friends all over the We have friends in Zambia we talk to all the time. You know, the magic of social media. We can talk to people on Facebook all day. Our guides in Brazil, our, our guide in Mexico. I always say that I've been to Mexico 20 times. I love the bass fishing, but I really go back because I care about the people down there. We've met so many cool people and at a time, particularly when the world seems increasingly polarized, whether it's over politics or any other issue, we have people who I know we would not, we might not get along with otherwise, or we might not agree on a lot of things, or we might never have met who have become some of our best friends. And either you've never discussed those controversial things, or you get into a position where you can talk with them about those things from a place 
of sort of mutual respect. And that's that's a gift to us as well. I think I'm going to stay away from the hot button topics now, but I, I will say this. And what I think is so cool about it is, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details and, and sour on other sports, but here's what I will say. If you don't stand for the national anthem and you're not respectful for that, they kind of tell you that you're not welcome here and there's the trailer and you're done for that tournament. And I, I think there's a, I think there's something to be said for that because I'll say it boldly. I think we're in the greatest country in the world. I'm very proud of the things that happen in fishing. And what I found is that it's all encompassing. A guy like me, I got a bait company. If you want to know the truth, I'm trying to educate someone on my bait by throwing out small stainless plugs throughout the day. If I catch some fish, it's a bonus. I've made more money on the water selling my bait and getting accounts than I have at the at the cash window. So that's kind of a nugget for me. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, talk to me a little bit about Mystery Automotive, Nick. If if you don't know, um, just so you know, phenomenal young young man uh, does great things. Brings his dog out on the water with him. TV cameras are rolling. Talk to me about that legendary name and kind of what's his driving factors. Let's go non fishing. Uh, he seems like he has a good sense of humor. I'm going to stop there because you probably know him personally, and I, I know of him. I, I don't know him personally. You know, I've worked for Gary Yamamoto's company since 2005. He doesn't own it anymore. They sold it to a larger conglomerate about three or four years ago now. But I had the opportunity to go to Gary's ranch in Texas and be around him a bit. I'm not sure he knows who I am. Um, he's, he's, I, I had several of my contacts at the company worked directly with him all the time. So the story that now that you mentioned the dog is they were fishing a tournament on the Potomac river and Gary's this guy, he has these two little chihuahuas and he takes one of the chihuahuas in the boat with him every day. And it was going to be a hundred degrees. So he made his son go out and buy a cooler and cut a hole in the side of the cooler. So he could put the chihuahua in it, have his head stick out and keep him cold all day, which is kind of an odd scene to start with. So being the introvert, I'm not sure if he knows who I am or if he's not. This is probably like 2010 or so. So I walk up to the dock and I'm waiting to talk to him and say, hi, Mr. Yamamoto, I'm Pete Robbins. I work for you, blah, blah, blah. And he's talking to someone else. So I decide I'll be respectful and I'll wait. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And the dog is standing on the front deck of the boat. So I go over to pet the dog and the dog jumps out of the boat. And he's in the water and there's a floating dock and he's under the dock. And, and I can't see him. I, Gary hasn't noticed this yet. And I'm like, crap, where, where's his dog? And I'm like, I just wanted to introduce myself to the boss man. And I went and killed his dog. But I was going to say that he said, you're fired because you killed my dog. And then that's the rest of the story. It was like the worst possible situation. So luckily the dog comes paddling out and I introduced myself. He has no real interest in me. Um, he was very pleasant. He was just kind of a reserved guy who, you know, had the, Good sense, good insight, good sense of creativity to make several history making lures. And, you know, one of which the Senko obviously is probably the lure that has caught more bass in the past 20 years than any of them. I'm a, I'm a five inch green pumpkin, black flat guy. Uh, it's sold impregnated, and, you know, for the, that sounds odd, but it literally is. It has sold in it. So it drops. And then, as you well know, uh, not telling anything new, but that, that lure drops about a foot a second through the water column. And kind of flaps its wings like a bird, so it, I think it almost hypnotizes the bass as it goes down. So, talk to me a little bit about the serenity and the drive. So, like I go down to Kentucky Lake, you know, I've been down there about seven times this year. But talk to me a little bit about the drive through the national forest or the roads that you're not normally on, on your way to the work and, and maybe your world travels. Talk to me about what you're seeing as opposed to the fishing portion of it just to give the audience at large that doesn't really fish a whole lot into that perspective. Sure, and and I'll tell you how my perspective has changed there. So I remember going to Mexico 10, 15 years ago and friends talking about the amazing bird life and the scenery and things like that. And all I could focus on was the fishing. And I have made a conscious effort to realize how lucky I am to see the things that I've seen To you, you know, I think of our fishing trip to Zambia and Zimbabwe and the first day seeing uh, crocodiles eating an elephant carcass and thinking this is the grossest right. thing I've ever seen. And then the next two days later, seeing lions who had killed a Cape Buffalo and the, the big lion is standing on top of the Cape Buffalo fighting away hyenas and jackals that are coming after it. And it's like, 
true National Geographic stuff. And like, again, I, I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but I realized how lucky I am to have been in places not only to see amazing things like that, but to see some of the last wild places on Earth. I, I remember the first time we went to the Amazon, we went to native villages and the people were fairly primitive. I mean, they didn't have electricity and um, they were living, you know, I don't know what century you would call that, but a primitive, well, I would call it a fairly primitive lifestyle compared to ours. And they, they talked, some of the guides had gone to Manaus to find work, which is the big capital city of Amazonas. And they had left because they didn't like the feeling of concrete on their feet. They had to come back to their village. And each time I've gone back to Brazil, you see it get a little more advanced to the point where you go to these villages and they have smartphones and, and you realize that how lucky you are to have seen a way of life while it was still existing like that and how much has changed during our lifetime between Starlink and the internet and the medicines available to people. Um, like you said, we're extremely lucky in this country, despite the, the divisiveness at times. I mean, I, you talked about this being the greatest country on earth, and I hear that a lot, and I b truly believe that, but you don't truly realize it until you've gone to other countries and, and see <laughs> what other people have to live through and, and just differences of life. I mean, I, I make me appreciate what we have here every day, and uh, fishing gave me that. Fishing gave me that. My hard work in fishing capitalized upon that opportunity. But it was the fact that I got to go fishing and that led me in that direction to realize all of those things about myself and about the world. My two quick stories that I've experienced and they're not nearly as cool as your, you know, your lion and uh, buffalo stories, but we saw a bald eagle fly about 80 feet above us and drop a shad down and swooped around because the harder meal that he had had slipped from his talons and he's swooping down over us and he's kind of spooked and scared and doesn't want to interrupt us to recover the fish and we just hope that he recovered it after he left and the second one is we kept seeing like 500 minnows just scattering everywhere and an otter was over there like sticking his paw in the water trying to manually fish him out and i was struggling that day and this darn thing caught about a 10 inch largemouth bass threw it up on the rocks and let it suffocate out and then he came back about 15 minutes later and ate it like it was just second nature so he was actually catching fish and i was i was trying to catch fish there um what's maybe a favorite lake in the united states uh that you've fished at? i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna preface that with uh, largemouth or smallmouth bass what's your favorite fishery that you've that you've had the opportunity to fish on uh i've been fortunate to fish a lot of good ones i haven't been to the california delta in probably about 15 years i would like to go back there I, i've fished a lot of the major ones, Okeechobee, Gunnersville, Rayburn, Toledo Bend, Lake Fork. It's interesting you say that because I also, my wife and I are about three years away from retirement from our full-time jobs. And we're trying to figure out where we're going to retire. We live in Virginia now. We're going to leave here. And the question is, do we move north and travel south for six months out of the year in an RV? Or do we tr travel south and go north in the RV for six months out of the year? And, and it makes you sort of consider, like, I, I would love Traverse City, Michigan. I love that area. The couple times I've been up there catching big smallmouth, there's a lot to do up there. There's an airport. For years, I thought we were going to retire to Texas. So she's pushing for Wisconsin. I, I think I think what we're going to do in all likelihood is when we turn in our pink slips or turn in our retirement papers, we are going to get in the RV or get in the truck and just travel for a year and kind of stay places for a couple of weeks and see what we like, see what fits for us. I don't want to prejudge any place, but I, I do. One thing that I regret about the international travel, and there's very little I regret about the international travel, is it hasn't given me as much time in recent years to travel domestically and just drive around. Like I like to go places. When I cover a tournament, to end up in a town like Gunnersville or end up in a town like Anderson, South Carolina, and just kind of see see the rhythms of the place. Speaking of international travel, like what are what is probably your favorite? international place that you've traveled not even necessarily fishing but just in general oh i'm trying to think i love panama like that's currently my thing partially because of the fishing partially because it's easy to get there yet still feels remote i don't know that i could choose a particular place i've been fortunate to go a lot of places um we're going to greece for our 20th anniversary next year and that was her goal for the honeymoon 20 years ago and obviously it didn't happen uh, so she wants to do that. And she said, can we fish there? And I had assumed we were not going to fish, but I'm certainly willing to do it if we can find a way to do that. Yeah. But 
That's um, cool. that, have you guys ever been to Greece before, or would that be the first time? That would be the first time. I was thinking about it. I had been to Europe a number of times when I was young, but I don't think I've been there in about 40 years. For all the traveling we do, oh. for, for whatever reason, I haven't been to Europe in 40 years. We've been to Asia. Oh, a, for a non-fishing trip, and it had a lot of fishing adjacent things. My brother lived in Tokyo for a long time. And when we went to visit there, I, I typically don't go to big cities on my vacations because I live in a big city and want to get away. But Tokyo is, and Japan in general are the most amazing places I've been to. What's the general geographics that you're you're from Virginia, correct? Right. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. I was just trying to geographically kind of picture that. Um, talk to me a little bit about maybe a future thing that you have, maybe a project or maybe an expansion of existing. It sounds like you've got a, a nice project there in correlation with your wife there. What do you maybe see your next horizon over the next 18 months, which would kind of I don't want to put you on a downhill slope, but which, which would kind of transition in your retirement. What do you want to do over the next three years with a better, been a better way to cue that up for you? Um, I'm, I'm not, never satisfied with what I'm doing, but I'm happy with the amount of writing I'm doing now. I feel like we went, when we started our site, we were producing three pieces a week for it. We went to five. Now we produce seven. Every day there's a new piece of content up there. What I really want to work on is work on her confidence. My wife is an increasingly talented writer. She does well on videos. She's an amazing trip leader. Uh, she's really good at helping people feel comfortable with what they're spending, what they're getting, with the, the logistics of a trip. I want to build up her confidence so she knows that if she suddenly wants to lead a trip to Australia, she has every capability of doing that without me. And, and I certainly don't want to be left behind, but when we... When we go to a Bassmaster Classic or something like that, people say to me, people know who I am and they know her as my wife. And, and I want to get to the point where she has her own independent personality in the fishing industry. And we're getting there. And she's worked hard at that. Um, I, we're at the point where once we retire, I think we will be gone a lot, at least in those early years. I, I see it. You know, my parents are in their 80s now and I see them as past world travelers slowing down. I want to go and fight big marlin and fight arapaima and peacock bass while I'm still physically able to do that. And you just, you, you never know when that's going to cease to exist. You don't know if something's going to happen to you or someone's going to get sick in your life. So for those of us who have side hustles or those of us who've lived what feel like fairly conservative lives, there comes a point when you kind of have to, to carpe diem there and, and make the most of everything you have. And I, I, our goal when we retire, we have two goals. One is sort of the year of yes. Where when people say, hey, do you want to come to Belize for the weekend? We say, sure, you know, we'll get a plane. <laughs> and my, other, two days. <laughs> yeah, my, my other goal is when we're sitting at the airport, we, we have such tightly scheduled lives. When we're sitting at the airport and they say, you know, if you're willing to fly home tomorrow instead of today, we'll give you a $700 flight voucher. I want to be the guy who says, yes, I'm going to take that flight voucher yeah. and stay here an extra day and maybe screw around for an extra day or sleep on a bench somewhere and just not worry about being so time constricted all the time. The, the, my goals are learning to be less scripted and to let see, let what happens comes to me. When, when I've allowed things to progress sort of organically and naturally, it seems that's when the best things happen. I love that. I try to live that way too. It's hard though. You know, it's really, it's really hard to, to just let go like that. You know, my mom, she, she always used to say, I came, I came to her, told her a problem or something. She always used to say, you know, let go and let God. And even though I believe in God, that's so hard for me to do being such a control for it. You know what I mean? Like I want to, I want to fix it and I want to do, you know, it's just hard to just let go like that. It, I, I, really I, I wanted to ask you though, like, I think I read somewhere that you were published in like pet crematoriums websites or something like that. So like, it looks like you have a pretty wide variety of uh, places that you're published. So what, what's your approach to the different audiences? How do you kind of put yourself in, in that? situation like okay who am i speaking to the the, the true fishing work which is probably 95 percent of what i do kind of comes to me at this point whether it's sure. a company looking for advertorial work or the various websites but the random stuff like there was um a bass pro named mark tyler who used to, who was at a tournament in fort worth and one of these boar goats showed up at his campsite and just while he was working on his boat i guess these goats like to climb as high as they can go and it would hop up on his truck, hop up on his boat. And then when he, when he decided it was time to go, the goat wanted to go with him. So he, he took it home back to Oklahoma. 
and his wife, uh, then girlfriend, was a certified wildlife rehabilitator, and they ended up breeding and showing these goats. So I wrote something about it for a fishing magazine. And then Goat Rancher Magazine reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to write something for us about this guy? Um, so that happened naturally. One of the walleye pros, who's a friend of a friend, contacted me. He owned this pet crematorium. He said, I need things written for my website. Can you do this? I said, well, I can learn. Kind of <laughs> to tell oh, yeah. me what I can and can't say, you know, about, you know, when your plans go up in flames or whatever it is, you know, I, what can I say about your crematorium? But most of these things are pretty straightforward. Most things, once you can write, you, they're fairly formulaic in that type of a scenario. So I, I've been lucky, you know, and the, the Technus Monthly thing is something that I always brag about because that's like, that's a real magazine. It, not, not to say that Bassmaster or In Fisherman or Outdoor Life are not real magazines, but Texas Monthly is a magazine that has Pulitzer Prize winners writing for it. And yeah. I pushed and pushed and pushed to get an article in there. And when I did, it was, it was super gratifying when they kept saying, you know, you don't have any clips that are sort of general interest. How are you going to make this a general interest story? And I finally felt like I had the guy convinced. And I said, let me just write it for you on spec. If you don't like it, I'll publish it somewhere else. But I want to be in your magazine. And that worked out. Like that was sort That's of cool. my great my great white whale to go after that and see that I could do that sort of thing. So I want to tell you a story that I've told on the boat probably 50 times. About 95% of it's accurate, you know, the, and, and you're gonna see, you're gonna see we, we we got we gotta tell a little fish story, but this this is actually accurate. You can do your research and find this. I'm going to butch the story a little bit, but I'm going to do my best. So there was a tournament in Fork. I believe it was a BSS Elite Circuit tournament. And when Fork floods, my understanding is that if you have a farm pond that butts up against Fork and Fork floods into the farm pond, the farm pond is now fishable. Does that make sense to you, knowing the geography of Fork? Yeah, this. I, I'm thinking you might be talking about the Toledo Bend tournament. Okay. So what happened, Nick, it was, it was the coolest thing in the world. They literally had this old farmer show up at weigh in and he's like, well, I know, I know XYZ bass fishermen caught Charlie because Charlie was my pet. We feed him one food every day. <laughs> so literally it was a nine pound, eight ounce fish that made a major impact on the tournament. And it was literally this guy's pet bass that he fed trash to. <laughs> and the guy was a little distraught because the rule is, Nick, and, and, and he can verify this, if you catch bass in a tournament, they take them out in the middle of the lake typically and let them disperse. They don't dump them at the same spot. But this guy knew to come back. He yeah. his dog food. Well, but what I'm saying is that he lost his fish, basically, because they just dispersed it and he, the fish was probably never found again. Have you ever heard that story by chance? I haven't heard that one, but it must be a Texas thing because I'm thinking yeah. of a Toledo Bend tournament a couple of years ago where the rule was you could fish all connected waters okay one guy had one guy had a jet boat the, the water was connected in high water times but in low water times it was not and it was low water times but he had a jet boat and he just ran it across the road right into the other pond <laughs> getting, so the question was was it technically connected or not and he ended up getting disqualified but if you look up keith poche p-o-c-h-e it's one of the most amazing videos you've ever seen. Of this. I've, I've seen that, and I don't know how to explain it, but it's almost like he's rubbing metal on metal on asphalt. There's, yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah. That, that sounds fair to me. You know, I mean, he, he, he did what it took to get to the other side of the... Yeah. I mean, he got there, right? Yeah. But I mean, at least he yeah, didn't... I, what was the story? There, there was somebody else that, like, put, uh, like, pellets or something inside the fish, right? Yeah, that's the wall, I guys. But, yeah, those, those guys were in a lot of trouble for that. Hey, so I got a question for you. I'm just curious here. Not a lot of context to the question. Do you have certain circuits or certain brands, or are you just kind of what I'm going to call a general, I can write on anything and say anything type writer? Get, to clarify. I guess I would say, could you write an app? Could you write an article for the BFL circuit, the BSS elite, yeah. the, the N, you know, the NP, like, you know, so I can. Like I, I cannot. I am a senior writer at Bass, and God, God. Dave Dave Precht, who is one of the legends of the sport, he was the mm -hmm. editor at Bassmaster for forty years. At one point, I was not a senior writer at Bass, and I was doing some writing for them, and I was doing some writing for the competing circuit FLW. And I was I was down in Mexico, and Dave was there at the lodge at the same time. And he took me aside, and he said, "Let's have a drink and talk for a few minutes." 
He said, Pete, I want to make you a senior writer at Bassmaster. And I'm like, wow, I'm the first senior writer who's not a full-time guy. Like I, I've really reached the pinnacle. And I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, I, you're a senior writer. And I said, do I get paid anymore? No. <laughs> do I, you know, do I get anything else out of it? He goes, no, it just means you can't write for FLW anymore. I said, well, that's the worst promotion. <laughs> but, but, but it was really a good promotion because, yeah. I, I mean, Dave was a mentor. And the fact that he wanted me on his team and didn't want me on the other team, to me, they followed through on their promise. They gave me as much work as I could handle, and they've treated me to some amazing things over time. But the fact that someone wants you on your team and recognizes what you've contributed and what you can contribute is really meaningful. I'll be equitable, but that's arguably the pinnacle of the sport. I mean, I think most people would agree. I don't want to get too controversial because I got to. But yeah, I agree with you. Hey, random name drop for you here. I think you guys are probably a small fraternity. You ever heard of the name Mike Kahanich? Yeah. Yeah. I so Mike, Mike did a video for us at a uh, at a outdoor sportsman's lodge there in Lake Newton. And it was crazy. He uh, he. He was hooking consistently on our lure because it was top water time, uh, a large bass, and they they tore him up because it's a power plant lake. So the story I'm going to give you there is a separate from that context. We've been there at negative six before, and you're dipping your rod tip in the water. You're dipping your hands in the water. Literally, if a guy stripped down to his boxers, you would take a bath in the water to warm up, which is bizarre as all get out because the air temperature is negative six, the water temperature is 60. And as as fast as you could crank a red-eyed shad, those largemouth were just eating in negative six. I, I never will forget that because I would think slow, methodical, lazy, lethargic, and you couldn't reel it fast enough and they were just tearing the spot on that red-eyed shad. So I just thought that was kind of a random story you would appreciate. No, I, um, I really appreciate that because my happiest place on earth is the, the cooling ponds for the Lake Anna nuclear power plant here in Virginia. Yep. And it's the same thing, 3,000 acres and 70 degree water in January. And do, do I even have what, like three, three eyes or anything like that? No, no three yeah. eyes. Like, well, you but, probably go ahead, go ahead, continue. But I, I was thinking with uh, my friend Harold Pack, who's now been dead for about 15 years, was kind of my adoptive grandma, grandfather. And when I was single, I used to go down every winter weekend. And I, would, I had my own bedroom and he and his wife were retired. I had my own bedroom at their house. She would make us three meals a day. And Harold, who was an old guy from West Virginia, um, we would sit around his kerosene heater at night and he would smoke and listen to bluegrass music and tell me stories. And like, those are still some of my fondest times going down there and not having the pressure of time, going and sitting around after dinner with him and him telling me stories about what it was like to grow up during the depression or, his earliest fishing memories in the 60s and 70s and things like that. And to have an influence like that was, again, something, you know, I always say my brother makes 10 times as much money as me and he lives a pretty good life, but he doesn't have all those hundreds of days of fishing. He, he's not an angler. Um, I think back, like, it's not so much the trips to Africa as it is the hundreds of days with with random people in the boat that you've spent that add up to a lifetime of fishing. Yeah, that's what's so crazy. Like, I can't, I can't explain that. And you've alluded to that, but I, I can't explain to you getting that text at seven o'clock at night, the night before the tournament, when I got to meet somebody in 10 hours. And it's, it, it seemed weird at first. Hey, what you're telling me is I got to, I got to jump in a boat for eight hours, fish with a stranger, hope I get along. Hopefully I like his fishing style. And oh, by the way, I, I hope to weigh in some fish. It's just bizarre. But what I've learned is, is everybody's out there for the same reason, which is to be, in most cases, a class act. We're all chasing the same thing. We all want to see people do well. We all want to compete. And quite frankly, it's allowed me to extend my competitive life in sports to give myself a retirement from basketball, segueing right into the fishing, you know, over the last 10 years. Because as you well know, mid-30s, I don't want to say you're done in basketball, but for all intents and purposes, you're done in the 30s, early 40s and stuff. Um, talk to us a little bit about it. Just wanna, I just want to give you some thoughts here. Let's not talk fishing and riding. Um, okay. What's maybe a hobby that hasn't come up in today's conversation that you really like to do to kind of uh, round out maybe the, the fishing life and, and all the other stuff? I'm a big time reader, but what I'd rather talk about actually is, and this goes into the retirement planning, is food. Um, 
I come from a family of more adventurous eaters than I am. And while we live in a crowded area that I'm excited to leave in a few years, I, I do value the fact that here in Northern Virginia, we have we have a shopping center with 31 Vietnamese restaurants in it. Wow. We have uh, we have an El Salvadorian place quarter mile from our house we go to once a week. And it's, again, it's sort of the family thing. Like you meet people through food. It's it's a social lubricant. And I've become more adventurous. I like trying new things. I like I like understanding how food and culture intersect. When you say uh, a family of more adventurous uh, eaters, are you talking about like Andrew Zimmerman kind of things? Like like going out and eating like monkey brains and that kind of thing? <laughs> it's funny you say it. We, we've gone twice to Brazil and once to Africa with a guy named Steve Yatomi, who's kind of our, our travel guru. Um, you know, he's been all over the world. You go someplace like in the backwoods of New Guinea and everyone knows him. And, and we once asked him, Uncle Steve, is there anything you won't eat? And he said, it, monkey is the one thing. He says, it's just, it's way too close to home. Yeah. But, but, you know, I'm trying. Like There's always like, you know how kids have sort of the try it portion. Like when they won't eat something, you tell them, well, just take one bite. Just try it and you can push it aside. Like that's where I am in my life. Nothing is going to make me so sick or so grossed out. Um, I, I think of we were in Japan. We were hanging out with the owners of Jackal Lures and they took us on a tour of their factory. And then they took us out for Korean barbecue. And one of the first appetizers was raw liver and a teriyaki sauce. And I'm not a huge liver fan. Ooh. And they gave me one and I did sort of the Japanese cultural thing of being polite. I just swallowed it whole. But then they were convinced that I liked it and I had to eat about six more of them that night. Oh, yeah. Well, that's uh, sorry. I got to tell a random story. It's mosaic wine. So I got to just leave it at this. My buddy was 5'10", and we'd go into a six-foot wave pool, and I, I'd push my hands on the shoulders to keep them underwater in the wave pool the whole time. And I was 6'2", so I was above the wave. Whatever it was, Grandma's house, she's no longer with us, but make long story short, liver onions. Don't like either one of them. Piling, piling plate. He got his revenge because I choked down that meal. With all due respect, she was a very good cook after 15 minutes. And the second my plate was empty, oh, Jason would like another serving. He loved that because he knew I was a big eater. So I was literally like cold sweating for about, you know, 15 to 30 minutes of that. But I'm, I'm an underground foodie myself, to be honest with you. I love trying new stuff. I'm trying to get uh, taking some stuff out of it, if you will. My, my goal right now is to not drink a lot of calories, to be honest with you, because I get lazy with the juices and the sugary drinks and stuff. But uh, kind of bringing us back and uh, kind of bringing us somewhat um, – kind of putting a bow in the conversation. What do you see um what do you see as the answer on on the circuits that they have and the exposure they have? Um I don't want to talk about the the forward facing sonar. We all know that that's a kind of a hot button topic, but talk to me a little bit about the co -angler. Uh this is almost a selfish question because I'm the co -angler. What value do you think that the co-angler actually plays in the major uh, tournament circuits that are out there in the fishing industry? Well, you know, m several of the highest of the high circuits have taken away co-anglers, yeah. which I understand the reason for it. A co-angler, Nick, is someone who gets in the boat with a pro, has to stay in the back of the boat all day, doesn't make any decisions, but you get to fish with the, it's like the equivalent of playing golf with Tiger Woods and you're just yeah. competing against the other co-anglers. And, and as someone I competed in a lot of them. I went to the California Delta and Toledo Bend and Lake Minnetonka in Minnesota. I fished a bunch of them. And that's where I got to know a lot of the pro anglers who I now know who led me into the career. So I'm thankful for those opportunities. And I'm sad that other people won't have those opportunities to fish randomly with a Kevin Van Dam or a Mike Iaconelli or someone like that. I understand why at the top levels, they don't want someone in the back of their boat because you know, you're an up and coming guy some random goober in the back of your boat catches a, a giant bass that would have helped you quite a bit. You don't have the opportunity to catch that fish. It could cost you your career or cost you tens of thousands of dollars. But I've always felt like one thing, the constant tension in bass fishing is it's not a major league baseball or an NFL. And they want to, you know, the thing you hear all the time is grow the sport, grow the sport, grow the sport, which means make it more like an NFL. But one of the great things is that an average guy like me can get to know the top, the top, anglers in the world. You can be a regular Joe Bass Club guy. I mean, I'm never probably never going to meet LeBron James. I'm ne certainly never going to shoot hoops with him, but I've been in the boat with Kevin Van Dam. 
who's, you know, the, at least the LeBron James of bass fishing. Um, that's, I think that's the tension is keeping the good things about having a small sport while also making it more popular or potentially more understood. Do you have, do you have to have a, have your own boat to not be a co-angler? Uh, you would have to have your own boat to be okay. the, the pro or the, the angler, I guess, is how you would turn it, determine. The story that I'll tell about KVD that I think is a, is an epitome of fishing, and it's a very positive outlook. When uh, when he invited us, that we were blessed enough to go up to his shop, it really struck me that his family members stood at our booth to educate people on what we were doing because we were invited into the shop, right? And it was phenomenal to me to be able to leave my booth to take time to eat my sandwich and, and, and the clam chowder that was catered, by the way, phenomenal meal, phenomenal accommodations, and just the humility because I'm like, man, I don't want to throw out a stat and be wrong, but the guys are millions of dollars over the years, legend of the sport. You're telling me you're going to put everything on hold that you do and you've got stuff to do so I can enjoy my meal as opposed to choking the meal down feeling like I got to sprint back over to the building, the combination that to me really stuck of the humility of the family. And, and that just, uh, that resonated with me to say, man, these guys are, these guys are just normal guys, but I've, I've heard nothing but great things about it. And quite frankly, it was, it was sad to see his, his career, um, transition to retirement from a selfish standpoint, but for a happy standpoint, because that he's now doing some of the adventures that you're mentioning. Uh, in retirement, but being able to choose this schedule as opposed to being determined or dictated, you know, the schedule or tournament that's going to be on the calendar. I, I will say this. Kevin is just an amazing person. I've been on the board of the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame for about five or six years now. And we debated for a long time whether to add two angler representatives to the board. You know, they're busy. They're traveling 200 and something days a year. They might not have time to to truly participate. And we ultimately decided to add two, one from each of the two major tours. And we added Van Dam and Brandon Palahniuk. And we could not have added two better people. Agreed. First of all, both of them worked their butts off for us. Yeah. And, you know, you get not to tell too many tales out of school, but you get on a call with Kevin. He says, look, I've only been on the board for a year, so I don't want to step on anyone's toes. And we're like, you're Kevin Van Dam. Yeah, exactly. Van Dam. Um, he's like, yeah. and he comes at it with humility. He takes the, his legacy and the future of the sport very seriously. And when there are things that only Kevin Van Dam can do, you know, if we need something from Johnny Morris at Bass Pro Shops, he says, I'm Kevin Van Dam. You know, I can call Johnny Morris right yeah. now and get that done. So he he walks that fine line between understanding how important he is to the sport and also remaining humble, which is next to impossible. Bringing us to the finish line here, I want to ask you one final thought here. So I know of you, I know what you've done. I know the publication you write for. I know that you've got that great title in front of your name with the senior but explain to me if i've never fished before and i'm hearing this mosaic minds and i'm interested in fishing or maybe i'm not interested in fishing but i'm learning for the first time explain to me why fishing uh adds a spice to to what you like to do uh and then uh kind of intersect that one last time with 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 the writing side of it uh, to kind of bring us bring us to a close. Sure. Um, fishing to me, again, I don't know how I got into it. I don't know why I love it so much. I, I don't think it's a biological thing because no one in my immediate family cares at all about it. Um, but it's all I've ever wanted to do. I'm fascinated by the next strike, by the next pull on my line, by chasing the next fish, by going to the next place. And even if I had never written about it, I think that would have always been a passion. But the fact that it has led me to so many other things and a better understanding of myself and, and understanding that it's possible to be passionate about it, even if you can't be the next. Sorry, I have a no problem. older dog here who's very excited. Um, even if I can't be the best angler in the world, even if you can't be the best coin collector or best basketball player in the world, if you are passionate about something like I am about fishing, for whatever reason, I found my tribe sort of, you can have an impact on it. And that's, I think that's an important lesson for anyone. If something's important enough to you, the fact that you don't have a lot of money or the fact that you don't have a lot of time off from your job, you can still find a way to make that work for you. Everyone has something to give back. And I feel fortunate that semi-accidentally, I found my little window of opportunity in the fishing world. 
Pete, if somebody wants to read your writing, where what are the best places for them to find you, or do you have that in the uh, any social networking that you're active on? And you sure. The the best place to find me is I'm on Facebook as Pete Robbins. Um, Better is the website that I run with my wife is Half Past First Cast www halfpastfirstcast.com. We are on Facebook. She runs the Instagram because I'm too old to run an Instagram account. Um, you can find me in Bassmaster. You can find me in Outdoor Life. I'm all over the place. Just Google Pete Robbins fishing and you'll find it. There's also a saxophonist named Pete Robbins. That's not me. There was also Peter Robbins, who was the original voice of Charlie Brown on the Peanuts cartoons. Oh. You don't want to look him up because he got in a lot of trouble. Oh, so half, okay. <laughs> half past first cast is the best possible place to find me. And we, we love to hear from people who read us, who find us. If, if you see something that appeals to you or you have a question, please reach out. We love to talk about fish. Sounds great. We, we really appreciate you being on this fascinating conversation, Pete. This was awesome, guys. Tip our cap. It was very interesting. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a great week, guys. You too.